Hello, my name is Paul Hilmer, and I'm Dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at Concordia University in St. Paul. For those students who wonder, what is a Paler Lecture anyway, I thought I'd provide a brief bit of background. The Paler Lecture is named after Concordia's third president, the Reverend Dr. Willie August Paler, who served from 1946 to 1970. The lecture asks senior faculty to reflect on the intersection between their Christian faith and their academic discipline. We regret that the circumstances of this year do not allow us to provide an actual Paler lecture, but we hope that this video will provide you with the resource that you need to complete your studies. Thank you. In conjunction with his talk, Professor Keith Williams has an exhibition of his humble ceramic pictures. Each unique, they encompass a whole range of sizes, shapes, textures, postures, and earth tones. Some are impossibly large, some impractically small, some exactly the size you would expect a picture to be. Ceramic pictures are made with a purpose in mind, yet what is their purpose if not apparent right away? This is the work of an educator, joining and guiding students' journey on the way to discovering purpose. Professor Williams' decades-long teaching practice, which includes ceramic courses, art history, teacher education, advanced drawing classes, educational trips to Mexico, senior seminars, and student advising, has been about joining in on the journey with his students, helping them find their own unique purpose in life. And with that, it is my honor to introduce Professor Keith Williams. Hi, I'm Keith Williams. I'm supposed to be doing the Paler talk tonight, um, but of course this has been uh, postponed until further notice. And so uh, because the information for Paler is built into many um, syllabi and it's an educational experience for students, the school has chosen to give us a, an opportunity to show a film that I made uh, with one of my colleagues, uh, two of my colleagues, Brad and Michelle Daniels, uh, two years ago. It's related to my journey with, with pottery, uh, with ceramics, and how um, I found the vocation of my life through this, through this strange clay stuff and, uh, and what it's meant and what it's meant to my teaching and what it's meant to my development as a human being. So the, um, I just love how this drizzles down the side. It's beautiful, beautiful stuff. So the film that you'll be watching is not really what I was preparing for the uh, uh, lecture, for the, for the presentation. There are some themes that are similar, but it's not really exactly the same. So what you're about to see is a placeholder for um, the lecture, the talk, the event that will be sometime in the future. And hopefully this will be edifying and interesting and uh, provide content for the students' classes and provide stimulation for you and, and your thoughts as we go forward. I make pots, I teach pottery. I am a potter, but when I discovered pottery as a freshman in high school, it began to help me understand who I was in the world. But the clay seemed to understand me very well. At first, I did not understand the clay very well. 
I was not a natural. You remember when you were a kid and you had your shoes and socks off and you went wading in the lake and that stuff oozed up through your toes? I love that. <laughs> that was good. When we went to the ocean, my father grew up in Annapolis, and so we'd go out to Annapolis and we'd visit and we'd go to the ocean for three days or so every, every year. And sure, I'd play in the ocean and we'd ride the waves and all that sort of stuff, but what I really loved was making sandcastles. And I didn't make the ones with the bucket. I would scoop the sand up in my hands with water and I'd drip these tall, drippy sand things that stuck together and made these tall, organic looking towers. I just loved doing that. I don't know why I didn't as a kid. I have more of a suspicion now. My mom was a high school and junior high band director for 39 years and was Wisconsin State Teacher of the Year. And she realized the other day that she will have taken students to contest for exactly 70 years. She accomplished a lot. My father was an engineer who watched my mother teach and thought that looked a lot more fun. So he went back and got his teaching degree and taught high school science until he decided that he would become the principal at the high school I was attending. That was fun. <laughs> My brother, my older brother, knew from the fourth grade that he wanted to be a doctor. I did not live life in a straight line like the other three people in my household. I seemed to ricochet back and forth. Uh, the movie Up, Squirrel, <laughs> over there. My. Uh, my mom and dad told me to walk straight home from school. It's a mile and four tenths uphill both ways, you know. <laughs> Snow even in the summer. But I would, I would diligently walk straight home from school. I just didn't use the sidewalk. <laughs> I would, in the wintertime, I'd walk on the berms of, of the snow and I'd be looking at all of the, all of the stuff to see. I would get home an hour and 20 minutes late and I'd get in trouble for not walking straight home from school and I knew what I had. I had no idea how I had lost track of time. I do now, I know now. The sense of time lives on the left side of the brain. Aesthetics live on the right side. When you're in the aesthetic world, your brain doesn't keep track of time. You can't make a good pot without it being well centered. And I would argue that you can't make good art without being centered yourself. I don't want to have the wheel going too fast. The torque, the friction on the clay can ruin the piece. Speed kills. I don't want to have it go too slow because I can't make enough progress. All of the parts of this process are about spending your life finding the right pressure, the right encouragement, the right method of collaborating with this gift of material in front of me.
And that's what the clay began to teach me about my life. If I take control of my life, I will generally lose. I'll play a worse round of golf if I think my way around the course. I will be a less loving husband if I do what I think is right without communicating with my wife. I'll be a stone of a teacher in front of the class rather than a responsive teacher who can deal with the students who are in front of me, not the students who are in my head. All of my life, all of my activities, the reason that I became a teacher is the opportunity to collaborate, to take a classroom of a couple dozen brains and hearts and souls and to try to do something meaningful. Sometimes it's simply imparting information, but usually what we're trying for that's not on those measurable rubrics is to change people's lives for the better. That's what we're really at. They say that God created us in God's image, our creator God. If I make it to heaven and God looks anything like me, I will be disappointed. <laughs> My guess instead is that Our similarity to God is our creative nature. We create as human beings all the time. We think of art as creativity, but of course business plans are creative and football plays are creative. When we understand politics or economics in a different way, when we try new things, when we develop new theories, we're creating things based on things that we already know. We are creative. We cannot stop our creative impulse. That, I think, is our similarity, our pale reflection of our creator. Sometimes we only plant a seed of change we suggest something that doesn't make sense to a student right away. If the wheel is going slow enough, they can be stretched open. And the knowledge or maybe even the wisdom can become clear. I oftentimes stretch the pieces out so that in the kiln and the firing, they will be out of round and each piece will be its own unique individual. We're dazzled by beautiful people who are perfectly symmetrical, and you go, wow, that is a beautiful human being, but I'd rather spend time with somebody with character. And sometimes they're the same person. Sometimes you can find a beautiful human being who also has character, but given the two, character is what I'm interested in. And character is what I'm interested in helping my students develop. I'm hoping to myself at some point become interesting, but in lieu of that, I will satisfy myself by being interested. I think that's more important for being alive. Better to be interested than interesting, I think. What we do know is that we have professors and advisors and a whole host of other people whose job it is and who want to help us revise our plans on an ongoing basis so that they become realistic and personalized. But more often than not, if a student is taking a second class from me or a third class from me, they come to me and say, Williams, I want to talk. And the agenda isn't oftentimes real set. Because what they might need at age 19 is not to know how to center clay, but how to center their lives. And if they trust me to help them do that, 
that's kind of incredibly special. That's, um, that's a rare gift for a student to ask of a professor. Can you help me be me? That's, if I can, I'd love to. And so part of my job as an art teacher is not to say this is how to make art, but, but who are you? How do we find out you and what your voice is, what your song is? And, and if I can only teach what I do, then I'm just making little copies of, of me. I need to be able to, to help people find out their voice. I didn't have another job idea. I've always wanted to be a teacher. But there are a lot of people who come to school thinking, I want to be a teacher because that's the job that they've witnessed. That's the one that they've had as a role model the most frequently. But when they see what some of the options are, they realize, oh yeah, teacher's not it. There's something else. But that early idea of being a teacher brought them to the place where they could find that other thing. And so trusting the process of life to be led by your ideas, your loves, and to put your trust in others who are there to help is really useful. The vocation that all of us should have is just helping each other find out what their lives are supposed to be like. And get there. And if they're doing the same for us, it works out pretty well. Golden rule kind of thing. Because this clay records every mark we make on it, It behaves the way the abstract expressionists talked about loving paintings that recorded the mark of the artist. And so when I started doing this, instead of making functional pots, my engineer father <laughs> and my practical mother wondered yet again, why aren't you walking straight home from school? <laughs> Why aren't you doing what we expect from clay? You used to make such beautiful pottery. Why don't you do that that we understand? And it goes back to that idea of who we were created to be. We were created to be creators, explorers, Wanderers, wanderers, folks who could define and then redefine our lives more than once, change careers, change areas of interest, take a class that doesn't seem to make any practical sense just because we're curious. Nobody knows that, that little stuff that goes on in every profession that we just do without thinking until we start thinking about it and say, hey, when did I start doing that? Who taught me that? Did I learn that on my own? Who shaped me? Did the clay tell me to? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> it's just that thing of becoming a master, of becoming who you are. I think the difference between a vocation and a career is that a career is a job that gives you incredible satisfaction, that you're well prepared for. But a vocation is a job that makes your life whole, that finishes who you are. That's a part of who you were meant to be. Create your lives. That's our vocation. Help each other create each other's lives. That's our vocation too. That's it.
We are creative. We cannot stop our creative impulse. That, I think, is our similarity, our pale reflection of our Creator.